if you have your Bibles, please open to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Cody, I loved the deal where as soon as you said, you know, when normally we would say greet one another, uh, you invited people to do comments, and the comment feed I was watching on my phone just like absolutely blew up at that time. Um, and, you know, I've always suspected that uh, while I'm preaching, people are already thinking about where they're going to go for lunch. And Deidre Denning, you proved that because as soon as Cody said, uh, let's do comments, Deidre says, hey, Mike, what you want for lunch? So I know, <laughs> I know it's true. And then Deidre, your next comment was, Mike Whaley, I sure miss your coffee. So Wow, I, I know what you're thinking about. But we are blessed to be able to do this. We're blessed to be able to uh, gather in worship, even though we're not all in the same room. I'm so thankful for technology. I'm so thankful for the, the hours that Chuck uh, Wilson has put in behind the scenes to, uh, to help make sure this can happen. And I'm so grateful for you guys for engaging and hanging in there, even when, uh, even when it's different. And we're going to continue our series through the Gospel of Mark. We're calling it Good News. And this morning, we are looking at one of the best-known parables in, uh, in the entire New Testament. This is a parable that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all three tell. And actually, when we look at this parable, I think we're going to see that, that this parable maybe holds a key to understanding all of the other parables. And so uh, if you have your Bibles open, we are in Mark chapter 4, and we're going to begin with the very first verse. Uh, you know, it, I told you last week, typically we say uh, while we're all together that I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And if you want to do that right there in your living room, feel free to, to do that. But um, nobody's going to be holding you accountable, so if you don't, we won't know it. But Mark chapter 4 Beginning in verse 1, God's word says, Again, he being Jesus, again Jesus began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and set it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. You remember last week we talked about the crowd was pressing in on Jesus so closely that he told his disciples to get a boat ready in case he needed to push off from shore. And I think that was the comment that Jeff Green said his loudest amen to, um, just the fact that Jesus got in a boat. Um, but here you see uh, that Jesus was in need of that. The crowd was pressing in. And if you've been to Israel, if you've been to the Sea of Galilee, your tour guide may have pointed out the spot where they think this probably happened, where the, the hills surrounding that particular part of the lake form a, a natural amphitheater with really good acoustics. And so when Jesus pushes out, um, they, they've demonstrated, uh, science has demonstrated that it was possible for a very large crowd to hear Jesus because of the unique acoustics and topography of that part of the Sea of Galilee. But anyway, back to Scripture, and I'm sorry if you were standing up for all of that. Verse 2, as Jesus was teaching them many things and parables, in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the earth, and the, uh, along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Verse 5, other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seed fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Verse 9 He said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. May God bless the reading of his word, because this is the word of the Lord. We give thanks to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. 
We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for the power of your word to convict. We thank you for the power of your word to challenge us. And Lord, I pray that during this time, we would submit to the authority of your word. Thank you for our church. Thank you for our church family. Thank you that the church is not a building. The church is a body of Christ. And wherever we are right now, uh, however scattered we are, we know that we are the church and we are worshiping as the church of Glenwood Baptist Church, even if we are not at Glenwood Baptist Church. So Lord, let us submit to your word right now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Jesus is basically setting up what we would look at as a science experiment. You guys have not been out of school long enough to completely forget how science experiments are set up. And you understand that in order for an experiment to be conducted, you need to have some elements that are constant, that remain the same with each trial of the experiment, and other elements that are variable. Okay, which means that those conditions change according to each uh, trial of the experiment. So we're going to do a, a little pretest right now. On your listening guide, if you, if you printed that out, or I guess you could just talk about it with the other people in your room, let's look at the seed and the soil and the sower. And I want you to talk amongst yourselves about which is which, which in this parable is the constant, the thing that never changes. What's the variable, the thing that changes from trial to, to trial. So go ahead and talk amongst yourselves. I'll wait. All right, time's up. Okay, so are you ready for the answer key? Because actually in the next set of verses, the disciples get together with Jesus and they say, <laughs> we don't get it. And Jesus says, you know what? I will sit and I will explain this to you because I really want to make sure that you understand. He says, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been revealed to you. But the crowd that's on the shore, some of them aren't going to get it. But I'm going to give you disciples, I'm going to give you the answer key because I want you to get it. And here's the answer key. Beginning in verse 14, Jesus says, the sower sows the word. All right? So you look at that. What is, what's the seed? Well, the seed is the word of God. And is the word of God a constant or a variable. Praise God, the word of God is a constant, especially in times like this. I am so thankful that God's word is unchanging, never fading. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. He says in Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So we can be thankful that God's word is a constant. But after this, after verse 14, where he explains what the seed is, Jesus begins to explain that the seed falls on four different types of soil. And since it falls on four different types of soil, then we know that the soil is a variable. Very good. The soil represents human hearts. And over here, we've got some different examples of soil. Verse 15 says that uh, these are the ones who are along the path where the word is sown. When they hear Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. All right? So you got a group of people that they might hear the word, but they're so hardened, they're so calloused to the things of God that when that seed hits the path, it just kind of bounces off. 
and it never takes root. So we're going to call this group of people a group of people with a hardened heart. You ever hear somebody say that they're an atheist? Say that they just reject God completely? You know, I believe if you take some time to drill down and talk with them more, you're going to find out that there's actually some different types of atheists. There's the person whose heart is hard because they don't believe. We're going to say this is an intellectual atheist who says, I don't believe. The facts don't add up to me. And little side note, I would encourage you guys that may know somebody like that or maybe that's where you are yourself. I would encourage you to listen in in the next couple of weeks. We're going to jump ahead in Mark during Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. But we're going to look at some of the facts that support a true-to-life historical crucifixion of Jesus. And then we're also going to look at the facts that support a literal bodily resurrection of Jesus. But the, some, some seed falls on the path, and it falls on people who are intellectual atheists, who say, I don't believe. Then there's the rebellious atheist, who says, I won't believe. This is the person who says, maybe there's a God, but I don't want to think about that right now. Because there's too many things that I'm involved in that if, if I acknowledge the existence of a God, then it would kind of cramp my style. So just as hard of a heart, but for a different reason, instead of intellectual objections, they've got moral objections. They don't want to change what they're doing. So that's the rebellious atheist who says, I won't believe. And then there's a third type of atheist. There's one who is hurt, who's been wounded, who perceives that God in some form or fashion has let them down. So they don't say, I don't believe. They don't say, I won't believe. The cry of their heart is, I can't believe. Show me how God is involved in my life. Show me how God is meeting me personally. Because if there was really a God out there, would he have allowed fill in the blank to happen? Would he have allowed my parents to split up? Would he have allowed my brother to be killed? Would he have allowed this natural disaster to happen? Would he allow something like COVID-19 that's, that's disrupting everything in our world right now? Those are some of the objections that a wounded atheist is going to make. And so they're all kind of the same. The, gra the, the seed hits and just kind of bounces off, and it cannot take root. Well, now, I'll get back to where I, I was starting to go a minute ago. There's the second type of soil, and this is shallow soil. Verse 16, these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The one who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. This is not the hardened heart, but the shallow heart. Friends, we are wired to go deep with people. It is the nature of the human soul to crave depth, depth in relationships, depth in experience, depth in understanding. The human soul is wired to go deep. You see this in Psalm chapter 42, where the psalmist says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul thirsts for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. You say, I don't see the word deep in there. Well, you're about to. In, two, in verse 7, the psalmist says, Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. In other words, it's poetic language, but it's basically saying, The deepest part of me is crying out for the deepest part of you, oh my God. 
So we are wired. We are hardwired from creation to crave depth. But you know what? Because that's the truth and the cry of our souls, that is one of the places where Satan hits the, the hardest. And he tries to fill up our lives with very shallow, superficial things. Richard Foster, who wrote the book Celebration of Discipline, said it this way. He said, superficiality is the curse of our age. Friends, our hearts don't need more satire. They don't need more cynicism. They don't need more late night talk shows. They don't need more hours of binging on Netflix. Our souls need more depth. They don't need more scrolling on Facebook. And so what happens is somebody might hear the word and they might initially receive it with joy. Maybe they're at a disciple now. Maybe they're at a, a revival. Maybe they're at a men's event. Maybe they're at passion and they receive the word and they're like, this is awesome, this is great, this is a fantastic emotional experience. And then when the emotions ebb away, they have nothing left. Because all of the other things that come in and crowd their life take over. And there's no depth of soil. You see, this is just very shallow and the rest is just rocks and sand. And what happens if you try to sow seed in there? It's going to take root, but it's not going to develop root. And it's going to wither away as soon as the sun hits it. So that is the shallow soil, the shallow heart. Now let's move on and let's look at the, the thorny heart. Sorry. Let's look on at the, the thorny heart. I actually got these thorns and thistles out of the yard, so I checked off just a very minor part of my to-do list by, uh, by weeding very selectively this morning. But here's what happens. According to God's Word, He says there's others who are the ones who are sown among thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter into their lives and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. So let's talk about the cluttered heart. Let's talk about the, the cluttered heart. Let's camp out on this phrase, other things, for a minute. You know, our hearts are like Velcro. They long to get stuck to something. They're made to get attached to something. And if we don't get attached to the things of God, then we're going to get attached to other things. John Ortberg says this, we mistake our clutter for life. If we cease to be busy, do we matter? A person preoccupied with externals, success, reputation, Ceaseless activity, lifestyle, office gossip may have a heart choked with weeds and not even know it. That's why, friends, this time of isolation might be so hard for so many of us because suddenly all the clutter has been stripped away. And what are we left with? Is there anybody in their heart of hearts that's wondering, if I'm not at work, if I'm not busy doing this, do I matter? Is the governor going to call me non-essential? Is what I do so much a part of who I am? You know, you've probably been going along with these thinking, okay, which one of these am I? We've all, we all love little personality tests, don't we? We've all really gotten into the things this week that kind of tell us who we are. Maybe it's the Enneagram and we're a six, wing, one, whatever that means. Maybe it's the disc profile, I'm an otter, I'm a golden retriever, I'm a lion, 
you know, that one. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's the Myers-Briggs. I'm an ENFJ, whatever it is. Uh, this week, I've noticed that um, a lot of them seem to have something to do with being in quarantine or being locked up in Walmart. And for whatever reason, I've been told multiple times on Facebook this week that I'm going to be the one that's licking the wallpaper over in the corner, <laughs> or I'm going to be the one that's, that's calling out fake prices in, in Walmart. I don't know what that's about. But if you're like me, you've been kind of tooling along going, well, I wonder which one of these represents me. I've got to be honest with you and tell you that this is the point where I got hit right between the eyes. And I realized I am very much the thorny soil that is so cluttered up with so many other things. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 almost reads like a playbook for me for how often and the different kind of things that distract me and pull me away from the things of God. But the cares of this world, well, what's the death toll this morning? How many cases are there in Autaga? What's going on around the world? Will there be enough ventilators? Will Congress and the White House get along with each other so that we can, can solve this? I get wrapped up in the cares of the world. The deceitfulness of riches. What's the stock market doing? this week? Is it up or is it down? If it's down by a thousand or more points, I get obsessed in the morning and I'm just watching that ticker going, will it go up? Will it go up? Will it go up? If it's up, then I'm having a good day and I'm feeling more secure in, in our portfolio and all of this. It's the deceitfulness of riches. It's the desires for other things. Sometimes I'll look at somebody else's Facebook post and I'll just scroll and I'll scroll and I'll scroll and I'll scroll and I see what this family is doing in their quarantine time and wow, it looks like they're really having fun or I'll see what this neighborhood is doing and wow, they're all putting bears in the windows and that looks great. Why can't we do that? Or I'll, this is what happens with pastors. I'll look at what another church is doing and how they respond to this crisis and I'll go, why, why didn't I think of that? Should I do that at Glenwood? And if I do that at Glenwood, then will the people at this other church think that I'm just stealing all their ideas? The desires for other things enter in and choke the word, making it prove unfruitful. But then there's a fourth kind of soil. And this is the good soil. Jesus says that there's a, such a thing as a receptive heart. Verse 20 says, those that were sown on the good soil, they are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. I hope you've noticed how often the word hear has come up in this chapter. We first hear it or we first see it in verse 3. The very first thing out of Jesus' mouth is listen. Listen. The very last sentence in the parable, look at verse 9. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. But it isn't just hearing. It's understanding. Jesus told his disciples in verse 12 that the difference between a fan of Jesus and a follower of Jesus was that the followers would have ears to hear. They would have understanding. The fans would be ever seeing and not perceiving ever hearing and not understanding. So what makes the good soil good? Well, it's not just hearing the word, but it's receiving the word. In verse 16, when it's talking about the shallow soil, it says that they received the word with joy. But I dug into the Greek a little bit, and the word for received in, in that in that verse, is the word that means to take by the hand, to grasp. And it was often used in relation to a, a tool or a thing that was given. 
And so I think the reason the word faded away so quickly with these that, that were in the shallow soil was because they might have taken the word and thought, well, how can I use this? How can I make use of this? What's the practical function of this word? And then when they didn't find one, or when they came across a passage that they didn't understand, or when they, were, they came up against a crisis and they said, well, this just isn't working for me anymore, they let it go. But the ones that, that hear the word, it says in the KJV, the King James Version, and receive it and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold, other translations say accept it. And it's a different Greek word than what you see in verse 16. The word here is the same word that's used whenever you welcome somebody into your home. Whenever you receive a guest and show them hospitality, that's the word here. You hear the word and you receive it into your home. You say this is going to be the foundation of everything that we do in our home because I am receiving God's word as an honored guest in my home. Do you see the difference? Friends, when we do that, the roots go deep into the soil and it produces a crop 30 times, 60 times, 100 times what was planted when we receive the word into our home and say it is welcome here. So, to recap our pretest, the seed is a constant, God's word. The soil is a variable. It could be hard, it could be shallow, it could be thorny, it could be good. So that leaves the sower. The sower is the messenger, the one who is sowing the seed. So here's the question. Is the sower a constant or a variable? Is the sower a constant or a variable? The answer is, it depends. It depends on who the sower is. If we say the sower is Jesus, then we know that he is absolutely 100% faithful. Hebrews 13.8 says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When Jesus seeks to draw somebody to himself, he does. 100% of the time. When the Holy Spirit begins a work in somebody, he is faithful to complete it according to Philippians 1 verse 6. 100% of the time. And so probably in this parable, the sower is more likely to be Jesus because notice he doesn't discriminate with where he scatters the seed. He'll throw it on the path. He'll throw it in shallow soil. He'll throw it among thorns. He'll throw it in good soil. He doesn't discriminate. Why? Because he knows that even the hardest rocky ground can be broken up that the seed that is determined to grow can push up through the asphalt and take root. And instead of being smothered by the concrete, it cracks it and overcomes it. Jesus, as the sower, knows that God will do what God will do. Whether it's rocky or shallow or thorny, if God wants to get through to that person, that person will be gotten through to, period. But what if I'm the sower? Am I faithful to scatter the seed? Or do I hold back? No, I'm not going to bother with that person. I hear them cussing in the break room. There's no way I'm even going to risk a gospel conversation with that person. No, that person's too angry. No, that person's had just such a hard life. I can't even relate to it. And I don't trust that God's word will do what God's word will do. I hold back. James 1 says that the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. 
And sometimes that's exactly how I am with the seed that God has told me to scatter. For the gospel to be spread to the ends of the earth, it requires a partnership between God, the one who grows the seed, and us, the ones who sow the seed. That's the point of one of the other parables in Mark. If you would, just skip down to verse 26 with me real quickly. Verse 26, Jesus is continuing to teach his disciples, and he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. You see, there is a part of this that only God can do. Only God can make the seed grow. Only God can, can it says it right here, the, the sower doesn't even know how it happens, but the earth produces first the blade, the ear, the full grain in the ear. So there are things that only God can do. However, look carefully. It takes a person to scatter the seed. Verse 26, the kingdom of God is as if a man, as if a woman, as a person should scatter seed on the ground. Paul says in Romans 10 that faith comes how? By hearing. And hearing from the word of God. That's after Paul in Romans 10 says, how will they hear unless somebody preaches to them? So there's things that only God can do and there's things that the sower must do. Verse 29, when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. This is the part that the, so that, that the, thower, that the sower <laughs> needs to do. Recognize when God is working in somebody's life and be ready to bring in that harvest. Be ready to, to tell them. 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. That's what only the sower can do. So in other words, there are some things that the sower cannot do because only God can do them. But there are some things that God will not do because the sower should do them. So as we bring this to a close... I want to ask you, as a sower, are you a constant or are you a variable? Jesus has already done the work. The seed is good seed. It's the word of God. And we want to be fourth soil saints, right? We want to be the kind of people who receive God's word into our homes, right? Right? But it's not enough to be a fourth soil saint. You also have to be a consistent sower. Several years ago, Trish and I got to go to Korea on a mission trip. We were working with missionaries in Korea. And I saw their dedication. And I saw how committed they were to sharing God's word everywhere they went. And at the end of that week, I wrote a poem about the experience that was based on the parable of the soils. And I shared it with the missionaries that we were with. And just a couple months ago, when I was in South Asia working with our partners there, I took out that poem again and I shared it with them. And I'd like to share it with you guys this morning as we close. A certain sower went to sow because he wanted seeds to grow. And since he saw there was a need for seeds to grow, he scattered seed. He gave no thought to where he'd throw the seeds he scattered to and fro. And if or when or how they'd grow, this the sower did not know. He simply saw there was a need for seeds to grow and scattered seed. Some seed fell on stony soil. And no amount of work or toil could save that seed from beaks of birds. It was gobbled up without a word. 
Some seed fell on shallow ground. It grew up fast, but soon he found it had no roots. It could not last. It died and withered just as fast. Some fell among a thorny patch. It grew a bit, but here's the catch. Also with the seed grew thorns. And soon the tiny shoots were torn and strangled, choked by weeds. So nothing much came from that seed. Now at this point, you might be saying, what kept that silly sower staying? Most of his seed has gone to waste. Another career might suit his taste. A milkman, maybe, or a lawnmower, because he's a loser as a sower. Yet never did it cross his mind that this was any waste of time. There never was a day he felt, I should be doing something else. He simply saw there was a need for seeds to grow and scattered seed. And some seed fell on fertile earth where roots sank deep into healthy dirt. And with a little sun and a little rain and no birds to come and steal the grain, and with a little of the sower's care, soon some seedlings sprouted there. And soon those seedlings sprouted shoots and soon those shoots produced some fruit. And with the fruit from those few trees, he filled a hundred bags with seed. Then shouldering his bags, he went off to scatter seeds again, never knowing where he'd throw the seeds he scattered to and fro. And if or when or how they grow, he does not care. He only knows God says to sow and so we sow it, but leave it up to God to grow it. For sowers always see the need and keep on, keep on, sowing seed. This is the word of the Lord. Our prayer is that it takes root in you. In the name of Jesus, amen.